How'd I get here? I asked for it. I volunteered. I wanted to fly this airplane because almost every mission you fly is operational. And because this is a pilot's airplane, it's a real challenge every time. mission? A high priority sortie to collect vital information. It's all planned for you the day before you fly. Squadron operations, two and a half hours before takeoff. You and your backup ready to go to work. Hello, Tim. Hey, morning. How are you? How are you doing there? Okay. You know a last minute intelligence briefing. And that concludes the items you'll be prohibited from carrying. Can I ask you any questions about these? Oh, anything to you? Yeah. A final check on the weather. In the forecast that thunderstorms will end in the first uh, third of Utah. About 344 heading for a little over 13 minutes. You're flying the mission. You check all the flight plans made the day before. In route charts, the green card, and map boards. Two hours before takeoff, you eat a standard high-protein, low-residue meal needed for the demands of the long mission at high altitude. The backup pilot pre-flights the plane. Tomorrow, somebody will be doing the same for him. 48 hours later, you'll be the backup. Day after that, you'll fly again. That's the cycle. OK, uh, what time do you go to bed? 10 o'clock. OK, what time do you get up? About 6. OK. It's serious business. Doing pretty good this morning? No problem. You'll be up there alone at 70,000 feet for an appreciable length of time. You don't need any problems. You've got enough on your hands. All that time, you'll be living in a spacesuit, sucking your meals and sipping Gatorade through a tube. An hour and 15 minutes before takeoff, suiting up for the flight. at altitude. You could get the bends. That's why an hour before takeoff, you go on oxygen. Everything okay then, sir? Yeah, thanks, Woody. It's okay. You're all set. Okay. It's a close-knit group. We have to be. We depend on one another for our lives. Dragon Lady asks a lot. Heat is your enemy in that suit. You lie there. You go over the mission in your mind. What track you'll go in on? What sensor settings over the target? What are the divert? Emergency bases? How will the weather affect the mission? Then, it's time to get integrated with the airplane.
It's the same seat used in early shuttle missions. The cockpit's small. It's a snug fit. You need help. The backup pilot is there. He's called the mobile at this stage. He's on wheels and he'll stick with you right up to takeoff. You are going to ride a bicycle now. You're sitting on top of two narrowly spaced wheels. And there's all that wing spread. It's a real balancing act. But there's plenty of help. Field ground pinion 6-7 taxi pins and canopy mobile. Local fly fly, you're cleared to be via be the boomerang route, maintain mobile 1000. Your departure frequency 327.5 squawk 4232. A graceful looking machine, but awkward on the ground. A glider with the same engine that powered the F-106. Loaded with fuel, packed with electronics. Updated version of the original U-2 that rolled out of Kelly Johnson's skunk works at Lockheed back in the 1950s. The sleek. Black bird, hand flown, seat of the pants, but with state-of-the-art equipment. You know what the limits are. It's all your responsibility, all yours to fly, alone. So there you are, no crew, limited radio contact. In each of us who flies these missions, there's the conviction that this is not just a job. Deep down inside, you can see yourself as the hero, a central figure in a group of 60 people who've prepared this mission, readied you for flight, people who briefed you, fed you, attended you, dressed you, got you out to the aircraft, put you into the seat, hooked you up, and launched you. We say launch, not take off, because so many people and procedures are involved in the launch and the recovery of just one pilot in a single aircraft, you. You volunteered, but you were selected too, and the selection process is a cautious one. They want to be sure you're the right guy to live and work with under stress. When you go over Steady, though, reliable, friendly. TDY. Okay, sir, just how many uh, TDYs are the crews pulling now? The crews are pulling about 140 days a, a year TDY. Let's say a young but experienced captain. A totally professional and dedicated Air Force officer who can handle problems on his own, accept a challenge. A man in good physical shape who can fly a plane that demands precision and is tough to land. The selection process is a serious business. Your records are reviewed. Then you're interviewed at Beale. And you also fly the U-2 trainer. U-2 and TR-1 pilots make up a small and elite group. Fewer than 300 of us since the program began back in the 1950s. So you made it. You're up there on a typical mission at 70,000 feet, collecting invaluable strategic and tactical intelligence data for national defense. You work with the normal risks of flight in this aircraft, but there are people where you fly who wish the worst for you. Your challenge is to accept all the risks and fly the mission successfully. You've got to be good at your trade. Approaching the target area, you know precisely what to do. It's all been worked out for you. What track to go in on, what sensor settings to use, 
but it's yours to do. It's a great airplane, a stable reconnaissance platform with a long loiter time and a lot of history, an impressive record of performance. You know only what you have to know about each mission, but you know who has tasked your mission. And they know you by name. That goes with the territory. A ranking Allied military commander has said, if all the U-2 TR-1 aircraft could be airborne three hours before a war, we'd have all the information essential to the conduct of that war. We fly other missions, surveying the damage caused by natural disasters, hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, forest fires. We sometimes fly search and rescue missions. There are two units flying the U-2 and TR-1. Both aircraft are virtually the same. However, they fly different missions. TR-1 pilots in the 95th Recon Squadron fly out of RAF Elkenberry, England. It's a three-year overseas tour. Their missions support the tactical commanders in Europe collecting battlefield information for NATO planning and defense. TR-1 pilots do not pull TDY. The U-2s support the folks in Washington by collecting strategic intelligence. To do that, U-2 pilots go TDY about 130 days a year. You come in tired, and you're recovered the same way you were launched, with a lot of help. The airplane is designed to be stalled one or two feet above ground. It's very critical that it be stalled no higher than that. Your backup, the mobile controller, gives you your altitude calls in feet and inches above the runway. There's 10 at the T, down to 8, 6, 5 feet, 4, 3 feet, tail still up to 3 feet. There's 2, 1 and a half, 1 foot, holding at 1 foot, down to 6 inches, tight. Pump just having to get a couple of vehicles on the runway uh, south to north, south right there. Finally, you're safely on the ground. Mission successfully completed. Your backup is there to meet you. He takes the checklist and the green card. Your written log of everything you were supposed to do on this mission. It all goes back to the people in NAV planning. Hey, welcome back. All right. Heck of a fine job. Yeah. Have a good one? Okay. Yeah. Super. Hey, man, your checklist. Let me take this. Get some of the stuff out of your way here. Tired, hot and sweaty in your pressure suit. But you feel pretty good. There's a lot of job satisfaction in this line of work. Tomorrow you're off, but there's one more post-mission procedure you don't want to miss. It's in the heritage room of the squadron that each mission really comes to an end. This is where you begin to unwind and listen and learn from older and wiser heads. And right now, it's somebody else's turn to fly the Dragon Lady.